And with regard to cell phone use, uh, there's some, a very important fact of science, and that is the act of measurement, it, it's a fascinating thing, measurement, because you can never measure anything precisely. You can, that is, with unlimited precision. You can only measure it with the uncertainties of your measuring device. And all you can do in the lab is try to constrain how uncertain that measurement is, but at some level it will always be uncertain. And here's what happens. If there is, if you're trying to measure a phenomenon that does not exist, the variations in your measurement will occasionally give you a positive signal, as well as a negative signal. If that positive signal is the idea that maybe A causes B, in this case cell phones cause cancer, a paper gets written about that result and then people, people get concerned that cell phones might cause cancer or power lines might cause cancer. This goes way back. And so, in fact, if you look at the full spate of these studies, even those that they thought not to publish because it was not a positive effect, there's some cases where in fact there's less cancer. And so these are the phenomenon of a no result. When you actually have A causing B, the signal is huge. It is huge and it's repeatable in time and in place. With cell phones, that repeatable signal is yet to be emerge from the total experiments that are done on it. That being said, if you're worried, almost every cell phone you can, you know, they have the, the cell phones on your hip and you've got an earpiece. So just do that if you're worried. But uh, otherwise, we, I can either say the jury is still out or the experimental results are consistent with no effect at all. People say, well, have you found life yet? Well, no. Well, there, you know, that's like going to the ocean. This has been said before, taking a cup of water, scooping up and saying, there are no whales in the ocean, you know? <laughs> Here's my data, you know? <laughs> you, you need a slightly bigger sample. In the 1920s, which was a watershed decade in the history of science, in that decade, we discovered that not only our galaxy, the Milky Way, is not the only existence of anything in the universe, that there are other Milky Ways out there. That recently? 1920s. Did, was it just the op optics didn't exist for that? We needed a big enough telescope, and Edwin Hubble wielded all the glass that necessary to accomplish that back in the 1920s. He said Hubble before the telescope was a man and, <laughs> and had his own telescope, the biggest of its day, and he made that discovery that there were these spiral fuzzy things in the night sky, we thought they were just local to us, the whole other systems of stars, 100 billion stars unto itself, outside of our system. Not only was that discovered in 1926, 1929 he discovers that the universe is expanding which means it may have had a big, back then, it may have had a beginning. If it's expanding, that meant it was littler in the past. Well, there must have been a day when it was all together in the same place. Thus was born the Big Bang. Okay, so now, also in that decade, quantum, quantum mechanics, quantum physics was discovered. That is the science of the small, the science of electrons, protons, neutrons, particles, nuclei. At the time, you'd say, this is just the... This is just physicists burning tax money. Because who cares about the atom? I got my horse to feed. I got kids I got. You know, you got issues in society. Yet it's quantum mechanics that is the entire foundation of our technological revolution. There would be no computers. There would be no, there would be none of what you take for granted. Your iPod, your iPhone, cell phones, the space program, without our understanding of the laws of physics as they operate on that atomic and molecular and nuclear level. And so the, the, the chemist has no understanding of the periodic table of elements without quantum mechanics. To them, it's just a list of elements. Quantum mechanics tells you why this column is there, and that's there, why this mates with that, and why that makes a molecule with that. That's quantum mechanics, and it's unheralded. You ask me if there's any discovery that has changed how we live, it is quantum mechanics. And I make, I make this point because I'm ready to, today you hear people saying, why are we spending money up there when we've we got problems on Earth? And, we, and people don't connect. The time delay between the frontier of scientific research 
and how that's going to transform your life later down the line. So they, all they want is a quarterly report that shows the product that comes out of it. That is so short-sighted that that's the beginning of the end of your culture. So it's... I don't want the religious person in the lab telling me that God is responsible for what it is they cannot discover. Because look at the hubris of that. You're in the lab, and you say, I don't know how this works. And not only that, no one alive on Earth knows how this works. And not only that, no one who will ever be born will know how this works. That's kind of audacious when you think about it. And then you put it down and go on to the next problem. This problem is a cure for Alzheimer's or, or cancer or whatever else. I don't want them in the science classroom. And so the issue is simply about progress and discovery. And in my recent forays into Washington, well, I've been closer to a community of Republicans than I've ever been in my life, because I grew up in New York City. And in New York City, it's, I think that person is Republican back there. You see? The, <laughs> no, not that one. The one behind that person. Yeah, that's a Republican. <laughs> There's another one. That's in New York. That, so you grow up this way. And I get sort of baptized into a Republican administration. I had two consecutive appointments in the Bush administration, one on aerospace, on the aerospace industry, and one on uh, space exploration, the NASA's future, basically. And I realized something, spending that much time in the community of powerful Republicans, that Republicans, above all else, do not want to die poor. So there's a limit to how far this will go. And I bet most people in this room, even those assembled at this table, were highly concerned about the Dover trial, wondering how that would turn. And I looked at that and I said, I'm not worried, because it's a Republican judge. And in the end, if you put people who are not making discoveries in the science classroom, that is the end of the foundation of your future economy. And so I had a little more confidence than others did because of this uh, uh, sensitivity to the, the money aspect of it. But we all know tomorrow's economies will be founded on, uh, on, on innovations in science and technology, and of course that gets cut short if uh, we lose our civilization, as what happened in Islam in 1100. And the last thought I'll leave you with, which concerns me greatly, if you do the math, okay? You know, just look, you look at all the Nobel Prize winners there ever were, some even in this room and ask how many were Muslim? And it's like one, maybe two, okay? I think a second one was in economics. And the one we referred to was uh, an, uh, described earlier, the co-winner of the Nobel Prize with Professor Weinberg, uh, Abdul Salam. And he's not Middle Eastern Muslim, he's Pakistani Muslim, <clears throat> okay? Now, how many Nobel Prizes are won by Jews? It's like the fourth of the Nobel Prizes. Okay, some high fraction of the total. And then you look, how many Muslims are there in the world? It's like a billion Muslims. How many Jews? 15 million tops. Okay? So you do ratio these numbers. Had Islam not collapsed in its intellectual standing in the year 1100, and you just do the ratios, they would have every single Nobel Prize today. So the fact that it's not only just a few, it's near zero, it is deeply worrying. I'm concerned about what lost, what, 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 what brilliance may have expressed itself and did not in that community over the past thousand years. There's no tablet in the sky that said it had to be simple to end up being complex. That's just a remarkable fact about the universe. So why not celebrate it? The fact that pi, pi, that, that pi, pi, right? <laughs> Let's, let's say the numbers together. <laughs> Three point one four one five nine two six five. We got a few. That's a nerd fact. There's a big thing going on over there. Not I bad. Not bad. The fact that you take a circle of any size, a circle the size of the universe itself, and divide it by its own radius, and you get that number. That's beautiful. I have to pause, and I, I get misty thinking of this. <laughs> It's not, that's, that's just, that, another one, another one, that the atoms and molecules in your body are traceable to the crucibles in the centers of stars that manufactured these elements over its lifespan, went unstable on death, exploding its enriched guts across the galaxy, scattering it into gas clouds that would ultimately collapse and make a star and have the right ingredients to make planets and people. 
which means we are part of this universe. As I've said many times, and this is, goes back, the, not only are we in the universe, the universe is in us. That is a profound concept. And it was, I think it's the greatest gift that astrophysics gave culture in the 20th century. If you look at people who are religious today, who are not in conflict with science, they have viewed their religious texts as a spiritual, something that gives them spiritual support, not as a science textbook. The, the, inter, the, the conflict in society is when you have those who are still religious, who want to use their religious text as their access point to understanding the natural world. And persistent efforts of the past to make that happen have just simply failed. The, the, the Bible does not work as a science textbook. In fact, Galileo knew this, and he himself was a religious man. He's famously quoted as saying, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. <laughs> now, when you talk about these things, somebody in the audience must come up, I assume, and say, well, oh, we only understand 4% of this stuff. Yeah, that's great. So how I love that, it. <laughs> how, how is that different from Bill O'Reilly saying, well, in that case, the rest of it's gone. And we, you, you guys are just, you're just expounding beliefs here. You've got no evidence <laughs> the for the 96%. The difference is... We do understand the tides. The tides are part of the 4% we understand. So Bill O'Reilly is giving a list of things that are fully understood. If he had given a list of things that are not understood, okay, that would be a different reaction. And it would be less susceptible to comedic mockery than saying, tides come in and out, you can't explain that. It's like, yes, we can. We've known that one for the last couple of hundred years. Give me a better example. So if he said... There's dark matter and there's, there's dark energy forcing an expansion of the universe so fast that it's accelerating. You can't explain that. Right. We can't explain it. <laughs> okay. I don't think he knows enough physics to be able to tell us what it is we don't understand yet. That would have been a more interesting exchange with the atheist guy. I, I, I forgot his name, forgive me, but the guy who, who, who he was interviewing. Now, if he wants to use that as evidence for God... But then we just have to come back and say, well, doesn't mean if you don't understand it, something and the community of physicists don't understand it, and stand it, that means God did it? Is that, is that how you want to play this game? Because if it is, here's a list of the things in the past that the physicists at the time didn't understand. And a talk show you might have conducted 200 years ago would have said, the planets do retrograde? can't understand that, must be a god. And we'd say, you know, you're right. And then 10 years later, we understand it, so what do you do? So you're, if, that's how, if that's how you want to invoke your evidence for God, then God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as time moves on. So just be ready for that to happen, if that's how you want to come at the problem. So... That's just simply the God of the gaps argument. It's been around forever. So, in fact, people who want to make arguments... And by the way, wait, wait, and I don't, I don't even mind, I don't even care if someone wants to say, you don't understand that, God did it. I, that doesn't even bother me. What would bother me is if you were so content in that answer that you no longer had curiosity to learn how it happened. If The day you stop looking because you're content God did it, I don't need you in the lab. You're useless on the frontier of understanding the nature of the world. And if the world had been, if, I'm glad whoever those folks are, there aren't that many of them, because if they dominated the world, we'd still be in the cave. We would have never left the cave because there are mysterious things out there and no, God is doing that and you don't need to know that and don't even think about it. Where would we be if their understanding of the world ruled the world? So I don't mind it, but just don't prevent others from uh, conducting that investigation themselves. Yeah. So he could, have made a, he could have made a better case if he'd had an astrophysicist as a consultant advising him. <laughs> he would have made a different case 
find some physics we don't understand, and if he wants to call that God, no, then you come at him with the God of the gaps argument. But uh, you don't pick something that we can understand, because then you're just object of mockery. So why, why, why am I even going here? Because I'm trying to explain to you that the, you fast forward, the, the dangers here is that what, you fast forward to 21st century America and ask, what influences do we, are we feeling now? Because that, per, that naming period in Islam stopped and, and it never recovered. Because the, 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 the way of thinking about the natural world Revelation replaced investigation. Okay? So I fast forward to 20, 21st century, and what do you find? You get things like this. Okay? This is in America. All right? So now, what I find interesting is, is, the, is the level of passion that it requires to actually do it. You gotta like pay for this. Okay? And it means a lot of people pissed off at the Big Bang. They're pissed off at the Big Bang. At, at our museum in New York, the American Museum of Natural History, they come to the Big Bang exhibit, and sometimes I don't feel like having that conversation. I say, why don't you go to our hall of human biology first, and then come to us. And that's where we have sort of monkeys holding hands with people in skeleton forms, and then they never make it back to the Big Bang. <laughs> They're gone forever. <laughs> okay. So however egregious the Big Bang is, monkeys and people is a, is a worse... Agreed, is a, is a worse transgression, apparently. Standing up on Earth, your feet are closer to the center of the Earth than your head is. You can calculate that the force of gravity at your feet is stronger than the force of gravity at your head. Because the closer you are to the center of the gravity of an object, the stronger its gravity is. It's that simple. Not more complicated than that. But don't blame your lightheadedness on this fact, because that difference is very small because your height is small compared with the size of the Earth. But imagine you're falling towards an object where your height becomes significant compared to the size of the object. Under those conditions, the difference in gravity becomes ever so great, like as you descend to the center of a black hole. So you take a feet-first dive, you'll begin to stretch. And that'll kind of feel good at first, right? We all stretch. Wake up in the morning, it's the first thing you do, stretch. And then you realize it's not stopping, okay? And you begin to stretch more and more and more, and you can calculate when the, for the difference in the force of gravity becomes greater than the molecular bonding forces of human flesh. <laughs> At that moment, your body will snap into two pieces, most likely at the base of your spine. Now, you'll be able to watch this, okay, because, no, because all your vital organs are above your waist. Um, you have important organs below your waist, but they're not vital, okay? So, you're, <laughs> so you just watch that. You watch your legs sort of descend. Then the upper part will feel the same effect as you get closer. So will the lower part. So they will then snap into two pieces. Now you are four, and then eight, and then 16. And then you bifurcate your way down to the abyss. Now, it gets worse. <laughs> Not only did you become this stream of particles, you are now getting funneled through the fabric of space. Because Einstein's general relativity tells us that gravity curves space. And in the vicinity of a black hole, you are funneled down to a point. So you are not only stretched, you are extruded through this structure, like toothpaste through a tube. And we have a word for this. It's called spaghettification. <laughs> it's a real word. I'm telling you. Perhaps the most famous image of Hubble is a close-up of this zone right here, which has been variously be called the pillars of creation God's fingers and all sorts of other sort of religious references. People feel that way when they look at images of the cosmos, of course. I was always curious, though, that in the same universe you have things like the underbelly of a tarantula. And when magnified, no one thinks religious thoughts when they make those <laughs> observations. When it's, it's part of the same universe.
I want to make an important point. This is not all people in the world, this is Americans. Religious people, the, you, it depends on which study you get, you ask, do you pray to a personal God? These numbers vary, but they're high and they're up around 90%, okay? It might be 85, that's actually not important, that difference is not important for the point I'm about to make. It's high, okay, in the West, in America, 90%, okay? What percent of religious, what percentage of educated people are religious? The number drops. I'm talking about graduate degrees here. Among all people with masters and PhDs, the religiosity drops somewhere around 60%, might be 65. The point is it drops with education level. Now let's bring in scientists. How about what percentage of scientists in America are religious? You average over all the branches, it's about 40%, maybe 35%. Uh, in there, there's a range, of course. Biologists, physicists, astrophysicists are lower. The um, sort of engineers and mathematicians are higher. So you, it averages out to about 40%. So this looks like, this looks like scientists are 40% down from 90% from the general public. But that's the wrong, no, it's 40% down from 60% because all scientists have graduate degrees. So the graduate degree in any subject gets you halfway there. The science is the increment from the educated degrees. I mean, from the um, all educated people. That takes it down to 40%. Now you go to the elite scientists. This is a well-known number. 7% are religious, claiming a personal God to whom they pray and intervene in their lives. I submit to you that with the current atheist fervor that has taken on over the past several years, I would say launched, the modern atheists are called, launched by the Dawkins book and the Hitchens book and the, and the Sam Harris book and the like. And I was just in Borders recently. Couldn't believe it. I was, I didn't, I, I, sorry I didn't have a camera. Borders books, there it was. A section called Atheism. It was like, I'd never seen that before. It's like, okay. There it was. They had enough critical mass of books to make a section. So. Here's my problem, here's my concern. When you're educated, and you understand how physics works, and you're mathematically literate, and you understand data, and you understand experiment, and you go up to someone who doesn't have that training, and they are religious, and you ask them, why are you religious and believing in invisible things that influence your life? What's wrong with you? Okay? That's unfair. It's not only unfair, it's disrespectful for the following reason. Until that number is zero, you've got nothing to say to the general public. These are scientists among us in the National Academy of Sciences who are religious and pray to a personal God, and I know some of them. And you're fighting the public for the religious beliefs? Figure that one out first, because maybe there's an asymptote. Maybe you can't change everybody. Maybe that's telling us something. Maybe there's something in the brain wiring that positively prevents some people from ever being an atheist. And if that's the case, in a way, they can't help it. And you'll never